save the counselor, the mighty prince of peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Melissa had mentioned, a few technical concerns we're working through, so we've updated a few things this week. So if you are a nursery volunteer from now on, you'll be able to view our service downstairs. So we have hooked up the TV down there. Um, so we're working through that as well as getting our presentation updated. I think I put too big of a file in there. Uh, so we will get that fixed. A few announcements for me. One, uh, thank you all for uh, welcoming in Don last week as he continues his ministry from Haiti. Uh, I know he was excited to be here and be able to preach for the first time his new book. So we are thankful for him. Um, looking at some upcoming announcements this evening, we will have evening service at 6 p.m. Wednesday, we'll have our Bible study at 6.30 p.m. Coming into the next few weeks, um, August 29th, we'll have our next men's event. So we'll have our men's breakfast at 8 a.m. And then we will have our fifth Saturday event immediately following at 9 a.m. So uh, if you would like to join us, please do. Uh, we'll have plenty of work to do that day. We're excited about that. Uh, so that'll be August 29th. Uh, WMU will be September 12th. Uh, will be our next one. We had our first day back yesterday. Yeah. Any updates there that we want to cover? Uh, we're eight ladies. Today. Yep. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So that is September 12th, uh, the next event at 1030. Um, our church picnic, we're, we're figuring this one out. Um, I'll, I'll get with Paula and team um, as far as what that'll look like on September 13th at 2 p.m. We will eat at 4. Uh, and then uh, there is another event coming up in mid-September, uh, September 20th is National Back to Church Sunday. So many of you are back to church, uh, but that is something um, that is being uh, hosted worldwide. So just wanted to let you know that is out there. That is September 20th. Um, October 3rd will be our next men's breakfast and then the trivia nights on October 4th. Looking inside of the bulletin, we are still collecting for Operation Christmas Child. WMU is hosting that as well. Um, and then our Bible school offering is still continuing um, through the month of August. We are rather close uh, at 200 out of our 250 goal. Uh, I think I'm quoting that right. Mary Kate, it's 250 or is it 300 goal? 300 goal. So 200 out of 300 goal. Um, and then if, um, if you have any questions on that, please see Mary Kate. Um, as far as other announcements, we did receive um, just a few trainings in the mail if you would like to be a part of this. Uh, the Kentucky Baptist Convention offers trainings each year for any ministry. I'll place this in the back. It's a free training. If you would like to sign up, the details are on that um, as well. Any other announcements? No other announcements. I feel like I flew through those very quickly. A lot there, but I just wanted to get through those. Um, what about praises or prayer requests for the week? Praises or prayer requests? Who has one? Yes. All right, yeah. Well, if that's what you want it to be, I guess I can just throw it out. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'll make Mark and them cringe. No, I, I appreciate that. I got to. I was listening to service online as well, um, so it's always um, a blessing when technical difficulties lead to blessings. Um, but Melissa's praying today it works. So yes, yes, yeah, we are we are working today. But thank you for that. It was awesome. Yeah. Any others? Praises or prayer requests? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Remember him. Yeah. Yeah. Remember him. Did you have one, Angel? Sorry. Oh, I do. Yeah. Um, I have a, a super fun little genre. Yeah. And they are really, many people are probably wondering why I'm so like, motivated and mm -hmm. inspired and over the year. And he's uh, taught in some of Kevin's children, and so we've had some kids just really financially struggle, and now they're getting ready to go to the rain this year. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Any others? Praises or purpose? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Remember her. Any others? Yeah, Tommy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Don. Yeah, yeah, remember her. Yeah. <coughs> Any others? Well, I have a praise and a prayer request. Uh, we are thankful that after three 26 foot trailers, um, six days of moving, we are finally out of Walton, Kentucky. Uh, that is a praise. We have filled up a few storage units um, as well. Uh, prayer request, uh, pray for us during this, this next process. Pray for my in laws that have to uh, put up with us for a year. Uh, we are moved in the parents' basement, uh, so we are excited about that. Um, and then another praise, we start our new series today. I'm so excited about this. Uh, buckle up for the next 14 weeks. Uh, I think the longest series to date uh, at Persimmon Grove, we are going to be looking at the Apostles' Creed. Um, and I'm so excited about that. Just going back to the core doctrines of what we look at um, and taking that line by line. And I hope that as you tune into this and you listen into the words that through this wonderful statement of faith that you can just describe this to your life and understand uh, what that means for us. Uh, if there's no other praises or prayer requests, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today, Lord. We thank you that we could be here, Father, that we could just uh, come to, to your house, Lord, and just know that in all the distractions we have going on in the world around us, Lord, that we can just praise you and, Father, just be uh, comfortable in your hands, Lord, and just knowing that you're watching over us. Father, we know that there are many things going on in the world that distract us, and Lord, that would pull us away. But Father, we know that the church should be on the forefront of everything that is going on. So Father, we lift up to you today uh, the many prayer requests that were mentioned, Lord, those that are sick, those that may be going through trials or procedures. Father, we just lift them to you now. And Lord, just be with us uh, as we go throughout this service, that we would just uh, praise your name in song and worship in scripture, Lord. And as we come to this series here in just a moment, that we would just reflect on what you're trying to show us and teach us. Lord, we thank you for many praises. We thank you for all that you continue to do in this church, even in the midst of a pandemic. Lord, we know that we can lean on you and trust in you. So, Father, be with us through the service. We love you and we thank you. And we ask it all in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for our next hymn, a few verses of Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. 
filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You may be seated. Outline is it? <laughs> I think uh, bring out book of Ephesians chapter six. I think an election is coming up. Uh, this will probably be verse ten through eighteen be a perfect verses to read for that. And it's, so you know what to do there when you go to the foes. It says here, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He's saying, be strong in the Lord. Put on Jesus, is what he's saying. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If you know anything about the armor, He's, when he pinned us down, he's probably looking at a Roman soldier when he pinned us down, looking at his armor, and you know anything about the armor is in the front, not in the back. In other words, there's no retreating in God's army. For he wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against root powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Talk about our government, that's the highest wickedness you can see there. I encourage you to vote them out. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have done all to stand. In other words, he wants you to stand. He wants you to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, anything about your loins is where you're, you're the strongest at, where your strength lies. Like your belt holds everything together. You need that. And your breastplate of righteousness, and their feet shotted with the preparation of the gospel. Above all, taking on the shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I'll be able to quench that off there. That's your defense. Now here's your offense. Uh, take, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is right here. This is your sword. And praying always with all prayer and supplication. In the spirit and watching thereunto with all pers perseverance and supplication for all saints. So apply that and when you go to the foes. I hope it encourage you. So uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for your day, Lord, and your blessing on it. Thank you again for your reading and pray a blessing on the ones that listen. And thank you again for your day. We ask for Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. So in thinking about preparing for the upcoming series and um, there's Roger, what Roger talked about this morning in Sunday school about standing firm on your faith. It's important to remember what we believe in. And so this song by Hill Song is called This I Believe or The Creed.
Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God the Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender, Suffered and crucified Forgiveness is in you Descended into darkness You rose in glorious life Forever seated high I believe in God the Father I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in you Oh 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven. And sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. Well, good morning once again, and I just thank you for joining us today as we begin this new series titled The Apostles' Creed. And we're going to be in this over the next several weeks, 14 weeks, and we're going to be looking at a lot of things. And we're going to be going a little bit old school here as we look at one of the oldest creeds, um, one of the oldest statements of faith. I think it's so, so important. But in life, we come to a lot of times and situations circumstances, you ever have those moments where you wish that you had a good instruction or a good checklist or just a guide on how to be successful with anything? Anybody ever have that moment where you just wish that somebody would have laid it out for you a little bit better? Uh, absolutely, every one of us. I am a checklist guy. I love it. I talk about it all the time. Every single day when I sit down to work, I create a to-do list, and I don't stop working until that to-do list is completed, and that my email inbox is clear. I am very um, OCD when it comes to that. But let me tell you one thing that I was not prepared for, not prepared um, and given the proper instructions, and that was moving. <clears throat> and if you know anything about me, uh, one thing outside of to-do lists is I like to be prepared, um, and I want to make sure that I have a plan, um, a schedule, and Natalie would actually, you know, say it's a little bit extreme with how much I like to schedule our lives and kind of stay on course. Um, so we come into last week, and we're preparing to move, and I tell Natalie, this is probably Monday, I said, you know what, I think we're a little bit behind just a little bit behind, um, we probably need to work a little bit faster in getting ready. And when I say a little bit behind, we have one room uh, complete. And if you know other things about me, you know I am an avid fan of Lego. In my life, there have been a lot of things that have been heartbreaking and will bring a tear to my eye. But maybe in the all-time top three is having to break down every single one of my Lego collection. And if you know Natalie, anything that she can do just to, to, to probe just a little bit harder and just to push a little bit harder, it's like, oh, you remember this Lego set? Whack! It's gone. It's down. <laughs> now, that may be exaggerating the point a little bit, but Going into my collection, I didn't realize it was going to take so much time. And we did this up through last week. We loaded on Friday. We loaded on Saturday. We loaded a little bit on Sunday. And then we saved some of the Lego sets. And I kid you not, yesterday we spent four hours taking apart just the final pieces of my Lego collection. Um, but through this whole process, I wasn't prepared. I needed an instruction. I needed somebody to tell me, you need to start on day one. If we ever move again, I need a three-month lead time because we're not going to run into this uh, ever again. Um, but I wish somebody would have laid out the instructions for me on how to do a proper and successful move while surviving your marriage. Um, and, you know, Natalie and I made it through. I think this is going to be one of the things that we look back on here in a few years. So, you know, when we remember when we moved and we thought it was the end of the world, well, it still was, um, but as, uh, as we, we look back, I wish I had those instructions. And when we come to the Apostles' Creed and we ask the question, why is it so important that we study this? Because it gives us statements of faith, it gives us lines that we can live by. And when we look at the Creed, while it wasn't written, just to give you an overview, by the Apostles themselves, it is a summarized, concise understanding that allows us 
know the scripture backing of what we believe. And let me share a quote with you from Dr. Al Mohler, who's the president of the seminary in Louisville, which I attended. He said, all Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed, but none can believe less. And this is so crucial to what we're about to explore. Because please know, this first line is very important, that all Christians believe more than is contained in the Apostles' Creed, because we still have many other doctrines that we affirm and that we believe within the Baptist community, within the Christ-following community. So there are things through this study that we may not cover, but this will guide us in our core primary beliefs as Christians. And let me tell you, there is power in confessing this as a Christ follower, the Apostles' Creed, because we are declaring the truth of the Christian faith. So here's what we're going to do. Every single week, we're going to watch the video before we start, and somewhere in my sermon, we are all going old school, and we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. We're going to recite it line by line. Remember how we would do the the the, the the verses, or sorry, the hymns, or the reciting of Scripture, typically within a service. That's what we're going to do. So what I want to do now, I've got it on the screen, so you don't even have to remember it. Uh, hopefully, by the end of this, you, you will. Uh, but I want to read a line, and then after that, I want you to repeat after me. By line, over the next several weeks, think about the words you're saying. Digest the words you're saying, and understand what the Lord, and we'll have a deeper understanding, is trying to show us through this. So I have it on the screen. We're going to read this together uh, line by line, starting with, I'll, I'll say it first and you can repeat after me, I believe. All right, we're going to be a little bit louder than that. I need the people online to hear you, so you've got to pick it up in my mic. Let's start again. I believe, I believe. in God the Father Almighty. In God the All right, we're getting there. Maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. Was crucified. Dead, dead and buried. buried. He, descended he descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now you see why it is going to take us 14 weeks to get through this. There is a lot, a lot to unpack here. And what I hope, every week we're going to do this, and as we read through this, we have a reflection of the early church's understanding and expression to summarize the faith that is given to us by Scripture. And before we get started today, we're going to cover the first line. I think it's important, as I would with any series, to introduce why this is important. So typically when we go through books of the Bible, we'll go through who's the author, you know, what's the background, and, and what's the setting. But today, I want us to take just a few quick notes, if you're taking notes today, it'll be on the screen, of why I think it is important to study the Apostles' Creed. We'll only do this today. But I want you to understand why I think it is important that we study this. Why are we going to spend 14 weeks of our series or our sermons together to do this? First, creeds define the truth. Creeds define the truth. If you're taking notes, take that down, remember it. Creeds today, specifically the Apostles' Creed, defines the truth. Look with me to John 8, verse 32. 
He says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus here, in his ministry, in his earthly ministry, speaks of the truth and tells us why it is important for us. Why it is important that we study the creed and why it will be good for our lives. Roger talked about this this morning in Sunday school and how it produces godliness. As we are going to study these statements of faith, as long as it does, align with the scripture, it will outline the truth that will give us freedom. It will give us truth that we can set our faith beyond. What does the truth do for us? So if creeds define the truth, what does the truth do for us? Similar to what we study this morning in 2 Peter, it sets us free from sin. It sets us free from corruption in a world today that is under despair. I know people are watching online right now, and I'm thankful that we have a a lot of people that that are watching, a lot of people that are coming together, but we live in a world right now that is going through a tough time. We live in a world right now that is battling something that we never have before and hopefully none of us ever have to see again. A time where the church is targeted. And once again, as I planned out my series, and I did this last year, I had no idea that we would be going through this. But more importantly than ever, I think it is time for the church to stand on the truth. And these words, this statement of faith, defines the truth of the Scripture. And what's important about that truth? It gives us eternal hope in the Lord. Let me ask you now. Is there anything in your life, anything in your life that is more important than your eternity? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If you put anything before God, if you put anything before our eternal faith, then you have missed the point of Scripture and you have missed the point of your salvation. And I would even question if you had it to begin with. Today, there is nothing more important than our faith and the truth behind it that it will set us free And Jesus points that. So first, creeds define the truth. Second, I think this is so important, creeds correct error. Creeds correct error. In our lives, we have a lot of error. Anybody here never make a mistake? All right, no, no. Okay, good, good. I thought my wife was going to raise her hand, but she did not. Um, I'm going to have fun with this one today. But creeds correct error. So what is important about the first line that we just mentioned there? If creeds provide truth, there is no error in truth. What does that mean for our lives? That if we look at this creed and we study the Apostles' Creed, it presupposes the existence of error. So what does that mean? Jesus knew. The Lord knew in our lives we were going to face a lot of false teaching. Turn on the TV today. Open up Facebook turn on the news, you're going to find there is some misleading truth. Can we all agree with that? So why is it important today that we study this creed? Because it takes us back to the basics and not only points us to the truth, but it corrects errors. And that should make complete sense to us. But I think, I truly believe that maybe for the first time ever, We have a generation that I'm about to raise Hudson in that objects the existence of truth. That's hard. That's hard. Have you ever in your life, ever, seen a generation or a time that is pushed back on the Christian faith like it is now? Absolutely not. And let me be honest with you today. As we study this, there is no greater danger in your life. We all have fears, but there is no greater danger than false teaching and theological error. You can be scared of many things. You can fear for many things. You can be anxious of many things we're told not to. But the thing we should be most scared of is false teaching and theological error. The church today needs creeds not only to teach truth, but to guard against error. So creeds correct that. Next, creeds provide rules and standards for God's people. We love, we love our rules. We love discipline. But the Apostles' Creed today functions as a guardrail for our teaching and instruction. Roger said it this morning. I put him on the spot again. 
I think everybody should have to try to teach one time. Try it. Just, just, just teach one time. And you don't even know it. Every single one of you, if you have kids, have taught them. You have disciplined them. You have taught them the ways in that which you would want them to be raised in the world that you have given them. All of us have. But what does that mean? We are giving standards for how we live. My family, as I was raised, set very clear guardrails for what I could do. I had a curfew. I had to be home at a certain time. I had to eat all my vegetables. I had to do all of these things. There were standards and rules, and I lived within those guardrails. But there were times that I may have disobeyed. Not often, but there were times that I may have disobeyed. The same thing is true of the Christian life. We call that sin. So what do we need? We need an affirmation. We need a standard. We need a statement that tells us how we should live. And it gives us boundaries for healthy theological discussion and development. One of the most important things we could do is have conversation. My favorite thing is to have an open discussion about our faith. My favorite thing to do is to have healthy discussion or ask questions and answer questions about the Bible. And that's one of the most important reasons we study this, so we can start those discussions. But not only that, let me say this before we go to the next point. Why is this creed important? Some of you today may be new believers. Some of you today may not be very mature in your faith, and that's okay. That's okay. Some of you may be coming from a past life that you weren't taught necessarily the Scripture through expositional lens. So why is this important that you really focus in on this study? Because it will help you in your faithfulness and in your maturity. To understand and to learn the core doctrine of our faith will only help you. Just what we did a minute ago, in the early church, they did that every single time. They would use the Apostles' Creed to affirm their faith in belief and confession. And we're going to do that every week. So it provides rules and standards for God's people. Next, creeds teach the church how to worship and confess the faith. Now, I had to guide you a little bit, and hopefully next week we're a, a little bit louder. But as we read through this creed, it should naturally move our hearts. It should naturally move our minds and soul into worship. If you were listening, and I'm going to talk about this here in just a moment, to, to Melissa earlier and as she was singing, and that didn't naturally move your heart into worship, we need to get you a chisel. Today, when we come to church, it's not a routine. I've said this so many times. It's not a checklist item. It is for you to be moved into a place of worship. And today, to affirm the most basic core doctrine of our beliefs and the foundation in which we're set on should move you to that place of worship. It should move your heart. It should move your soul. It should move your mind. The very words of this creed that Melissa just sang should move you into that place of worship. Our prayers that we speak here every single Sunday, every single night that you go to sleep, every single meal should be a moment in ascribing this and thanking God Almighty. Take this next point down. We just have a few more here before we get into the first line. Creeds connect us to the faith of our fathers. We all love a good tradition. This may be one of my favorite, one of my favorite reasons to study the creed. We all love a good tradition. And we celebrate in it frequently. Everybody here has a Christmas tradition. Everybody here has a Thanksgiving tradition. Everybody has a holiday tradition. Some of you have reunion traditions. Even the church. So many times what happens, they're simply that. We get caught up in tradition. We get caught up in just going through the motions. But I want to show you today and for the next several weeks that this creed is more than words on a page. It is more than just reciting these statements of faith. It contains the witness of those that have gone on before us. And do you realize that we have a blood-bought relationship with those individuals, even here in this church? I am not your first pastor. I know that. I am not the first minister that stood in this pulpit. I am preaching in a pulpit where great men have stood and preached the gospel. And I don't take that role lightly. I am preaching to a church that have had saints that have gone on before us. And many of you know them. Many of them were your parents. They were your grandparents. And they set 
the tradition and the path forward for Persimmon Grove. And without those individuals, the lights wouldn't be on. And we shouldn't take that lightly. And why? Because they affirm the exact statements of faith that we just mentioned. They affirm the exact preaching that we are continuing every single week. And knowing that and believing that should excite us. Individuals that you may have never met, individuals that I never met, and I hear about in, in, in traditions, and I hear about in deacons, and I hear about in what they did for our church, it excites me that I get to carry on that tradition. Today, when you think about your mother, when you think about your father, your grandpa, or your grandma that taught you how to be a Christ follower, that taught you how to live a good life, it should excite you that you get to carry on the same faith that they had in believing in the same God. That should excite us. This creed connects us to the faith of those individuals. Two more things here. Next, creeds summarize the faith. Let me be clear. No creed or no statement of faith can replace the scripture. This creed is not the Bible. It is not the holy scripture. But it does have a place within the Christian life. It summarizes the content in really succinct statements in order to equip us with our Christian faith. Crucial pieces of our faith. So it summarizes for you. As I mentioned before, we may believe more, but we cannot believe less. And then finally, take this down. The final reason why I think it's important that we study the creed. It defines true Christian unity. Affirmation and belief in this creed weaves us together as a family in Christ. Statements of faith unite every single one of us no matter what your age. You know, one of my favorite things about this church is that we are multi-generational. We have all ages. We have all different types of backgrounds. We have all different types of people, and I think that's so, so important. And why is that? Because we all come together for one common goal and one common reason, to affirm the statement and knowing that we believe in Jesus Christ is our Lord. Every single week. I'm not trying. Let, now, don't get offended here. I'm not trying to build my message just to hit one demographic. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to try to reach just the, the 20 to 40-year-olds or the 40 to 60 or the 60 to 80. That is not my goal. My goal today is to reach every single person because the message doesn't change whether you're 20, 30, 100, 150. It is all the same that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we all affirm that. I will not put on a show. And today... The creed defines true Christian unity, and it can bridge those divides. Not only that, and we're going to get into it before we get into this first line, it can bridge denominational divides. We, we get caught up in the name on the door. And I want to be clear here. What we are learning is affirmed by every single person that wants to go to heaven. Let me say that again. I didn't say it's affirmed by every Baptist. I didn't say it's affirmed by every Christian, it's not affirmed by every Methodist, it's not affirmed by every Catholic, it is affirmed by every single person that wants to go to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, you need to believe this. If you want to go to heaven, you will affirm this with every other person that's going to join us there. It will bridge those divides and it will define true Christian unity because the truth of Christ brings us together more than anything else we value. And that's why we study it. That's why we begin here. So now we, we know why it's important to study this creed. Let's jump into it itself. And I want to take it line by line over the next few weeks. And we're, we're going to spend plenty of time on each of these lines. But I want to start with two simple words. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. I believe. I believe. Say that with me. I believe. These two words, when joined together are the most explosive words any humans can utter. As we were traveling to here today, Natalie and I looked up the Merriam-Webster definition of belief. It is to understand and know what is true. But not only that, it is to feel what is true. We use those terms so loosely. I could come around and I could ask you, what's some things that you believe in? I believe in what? I believe in this. I believe in that. I believe in, in so many things that we use these words, 
that really when you boil it down and you dive into those two words, ah, you kind of believe it. You kind of agree with it. I believe, like let, let's think here as, a, as an affirm statement of faith that we can hold true. Think about the weight of this, that we know with absolute certainty, there is no doubt in my mind that this is true. I believe that the Kentucky Wildcats are the best basketball team ever. That is true. That is, it's on the Apostles' Creed. Pretty close. They considered it. <laughs> they didn't really consider it. I'll take that back. Don't, don't edit that out. I don't need that on the news that I, I said the Kentucky Wildcats were in the Apostles' Creed. They're, they're not. But in the Christian faith, those words hold so much power. When you say, I believe, you are putting a personal emphasis behind knowing and feeling and understanding that it is true. Why? Because those words open the door to your eternal faith, and they are the foundation. Those two words, from the very beginning, are the foundation of the Christian faith. We enter into, think about this, I can't, I can't, make this, I can't stress the importance of this enough. We enter into our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our relationship with the Lord God Almighty by saying what? I believe you are Lord. And that's not just saying it, that's feeling it, and that is knowing it. It is intimate and it is true. We respond to this truth with trust, that is, with belief. And Christianity is not belief, and let me, let me explain this to you, it's not belief just to believe. It is a truth that Jesus Christ is Lord the Son of God and the Savior. Look at one of the most powerful stories in Scripture in Acts 16. Paul is in prison here with Silas. We, we just covered this a few, few months ago. Paul, or actually a few years ago now, Paul is here in prison. And just think about what's about to happen to this man, the guard that is watching them as they're about to escape. And I won't spend much time on this, but it gives us an understanding of this word. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now if you stop there and you think about this, an earthquake occurs and all the locks come off. That's, uh, that's pretty supernatural. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he knew he was in for it here. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's stop there for just a moment. This individual was about to take their life they were about to end everything that they knew because they thought they were going to be killed. They thought the prisoners had escaped, and that was what they were responsible for. They thought, if Paul and Silas, these individuals that we are keeping within prison, if they escape, I'm going to be killed anyways. Why not do it myself? The foreknowledge of God here knew exactly the situation this man would be in. And he asked the single most important question in all of the Bible. In all of the Bible, the most important question that's asked is in this, this verse here. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, what? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all those that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had what? Believed in God. This response once again reveals the absolute centrality in the belief of the Christian faith. A man in his darkest hour is given another chance, and he asks the question, what must I do? Believe. And do you know that every single stanza of the Apostles' Creed begins with this. The Latin word credo, affirming belief. Like Paul's conversation or response to the jailer, 
this creed affirms the connection of faith to the Christian life. So as we begin our study, know this. The creed is not just merely interesting, but it is urgently needed. In our lives, it is needed. Our beliefs have been diluted. Our world has put the church in the background. But the creed that we study today exposits the fundamental core of the Christian faith. We believe. And it goes even further. As we finish this out with this first line. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Now, we've covered a lot of this, and what a way to begin. And some of you may have saw this week, um, I posted on Facebook, and I brought it with me. I posted a picture of me, or sorry, not me, but uh, Hudson and my father. Yeah, one of my favorite pictures ever, ever. I love this picture that my dad had the opportunity to hug. Um, it, it almost makes me, it has made me emotional to see the generation um, skip there. There's a lot of power in being a dad. He was well-respected. My father is well-respected in the home. He was feared. He was loved. He was feared uh, a lot in the home. But he had a big job. My dad had a big job raising me. He had to provide for us. He had to get up every single day for work. He had to take care of me. He had to teach me. He had to guide me. But in my eyes, he was a superhero. So it's fitting that the creed opens by giving a line to explain our Father in Heaven, to understand the importance in our lives. But unfortunately today, some modern theologians have a problem with the God of the Bible. I heard a story, a true story, Gordon Kaufman out of Harvard University. He was a theologian, he was their lead theologian studying there, wrote a book. It was actually titled, God the Problem. God the Problem. The purpose of this book, this a few years ago, was how to make the God of the Bible more palatable. For generations that are trying to learn about God, how to better understand Him without reading into all the things that happen within the Bible, some of those moments that are a little bit harder to read. He wrote, stating in this book, that the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament that we read about is different today. He was writing to a generation trying to tell them that you can discount a lot of this out of the Scripture, that this God isn't really the God that you're reading. He's not that, that judgmental God. He's not that just God. He, he's not going to send people to, to this place called hell. He was writing all of these things, and it wasn't viewed very well in the Christian circle. So one day he comes in to his classroom, and one of his students had written on the board, Gordon Kaufman, the problem by God. And that's the problem today. We want to modernize God. We want to put Him in a box. We want to change our language to make Him easier to believe in for those that struggle with certain things. You know the problem with that? God has never changed. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the God that has written scriptures, the God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, has never changed and He never will. And as the church today... We need to stop trying to change him. Because notice, the creed doesn't simply begin with, I believe in God. Rather, it goes beyond to describe the character of God. Take this down. The first thing we need to understand about this is our God is self-revealing. You cannot hide from our God. Romans 1.20 says this, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are what? Without excuse. You can reject all you want, the knowledge of the Lord, but Scripture states everyone knows that God exists. Our Sunday evening study, when we look through foundations, tells us, this is general revelation, you see God all around you. Look right beside you. God has worked in the making of that person beside you. Some of you are probably questioning that. I don't know about that. I don't know if God worked in this person. Um, some reasons I, I doubt that. Carl F.H. Henry said this. I love this. God loves us so much that he forfeits his own personal privacy that his creatures might know him. Our hearts today are corrupted to such a degree that we are ignorant without God's self-revelation. 
But unfortunately, many people we know, many people you talk with, many preachers today, many people that confess to be teaching the word of the Lord, believe in an ordinary God. This God that, that can't be of the scripture. But let me give you another piece of good news. Our God is far from ordinary. The identity that we take in Christ is through the confession of the God Almighty, the God who reveals himself. So he is self-revealing. Next, he is personal. The creed, like the scripture, indicates the first person of the Trinity has revealed himself to us as what? As Father. I mentioned my father earlier. One thing I do every morning without, without mention is I call my dad. And we talk about a lot of stuff, some things that really don't have much meaning. We talk about everything. Why? Because our relationship is personal. Because we love each other. And our relationship with our Father in heaven is personal. Look at another statement of faith we uphold in the Baptist faith and message. It says, God as Father reigns with providential care over His universe, His creatures, and the flow of the stream of human history according to the purposes of His grace. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and all-wise. God is Father in truth to those who become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is fatherly in His attitude toward all men. The fact that we live in a world today that God has provided us food and natural resources and everything we need to do to survive is evidence that God loves us. So it is time today that we take our relationship and our opportunity to worship God seriously and know that He loves us on a deep level. Let me close with this. The Father Almighty. I'm closing here by revisiting the line. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Just as God is self-revealed, He is personal. He is also all-powerful. From the beginning, He makes this clearly known. Look at Genesis 17.1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God, what? Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And in the creed, when you look at this word, this word almighty is a collective that's meant to represent all of God's attributes. And as a church, we are a church that stands firm in this. From our roots, from what we know, from what we believe, from what we hold true in our foundation, we affirm that God is perfect in all ways. If you disagree with that, this is not the church for you. Our God, the one and only God, is perfect in all ways. And the truth is, that's where our worship begins. We measure every single doctrine against this. Every single hymn that Melissa or Mark lead us in has to affirm this. Every single message that is preached in this pulpit has to affirm that. Every single prayer that is spoken has to affirm that. Every single thing we do must fit His glorious reign. And to close the day, our lives should be built around this. Because we're going to get into some theological stuff. We're going to get into some good stuff here. But ask the question, what do you believe in? Is it something material? Is it something shallow? Is it something that can be easily replaced? Or do you believe in and giving your life to a God that is self-revealing, that is personal and all-powerful? Because today, that's what the Lord requires, that we believe in God the Father Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we could just study your word, study your scripture. Lord, we're starting a new series now, and Father, there's just so much to unpack. As we think about our lives, we think about everything that we're taught on a day-to-day -day basis. There's so many distractions pushing against the, the Christian movement, the, the Christ following that we have ascribed to. Lord, just be with us now as a church, that we would continue to uphold these beliefs and affirm these beliefs, Father, and just take a message to the world that points to belief in you. And Father, if there's someone here today that, that hasn't taken that step or hasn't made that move, Lord, we just ask and we just challenge that they would do so now. And Father, as a church, that as we move into worship every day, not just here on Sunday, that we would affirm this and that we would get excited and we would feel this true call and this true heart of worship that is in you. And Father, today as we close, and as we close in prayer here, 
Let us just be reminded of what we believe in. Lord, of all the individuals that have taught here before and have gone on before us, that we believe and are connected to them through your holy word and through your scripture, knowing that you are God the Father Almighty. And we thank you for that, Lord, and we ask it all in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, for being with us today and joining us tonight we'll have evening service at 6 p.m uh, then wednesday evening at 6 30 next sunday we'll celebrate in communion um, we'll continue our series but just so thankful uh, that we were able to begin this today any other announcements that i may have missed all right well if not mark would you close in prayer Place today, we ask that you be with us wherever we go. 